I had a guy came out, he had on a sport coat, and he looked at me and he says, so what on earth did you buy that place for, that big old fallen down building? And I said, well, you know, some dummies, when they retire, go out and buy a Lexus. And I'm a dummy, I bought a old building, because that's what I like. And, and he said, I have a Lexus. <laughs> Oh, it's all about the Blue Room. It was just a building that was sitting here and my wife and I inherited the property across the street. And uh, my neighbor owned this building. He was a minister and everybody knew about the building and its history, but nobody did much about it for a number of years and it kind of got piled up with junk. The neighbor wanted to sell it and so we bought it. This building was a mill, but it wasn't ever much of a mill. As a matter of fact, the story is, is that Johnny Hinky, and Johnny Hinky is what this is all about, he bought this building with money that he got selling whiskey in Chicago with Al Capone, and he lived in this old building all by himself, and he was nothing but a total eccentric and he used the front room and anybody that stopped by could come in and have a beer. This is the actual blue room. And the room supposedly was often covered in smoke and very blue. And so that's why they called it the blue room. And uh, guys would come here and play cards and drink beer out of the can. Hinky lived in the back and of course it was prohibition. And he did get liquor license number one whenever Prohibition was over in the 30s. And then he ran the place from the 30s until the 70s. But all of the local judges and officials would drive out to the Blue Room and drink. He never put a sign on it. You wouldn't even know it was a bar unless you knew it was here and I bought it so I could sit on the front porch of the Blue Room and uh, talk to people like you and people riding up and down the Jane Addams Trail which passes between the, the Blue Room and my home. I like sitting on the front porch and waiting until somebody walks by. Hi, it's really hot. It is. So what's your name? Curly Fizzle. So you know I know who Fizzle is. Yes, uh, my grandpa. I've heard so many stories about this place and out here. I've heard stories of guys showing up, hunters with pretty red dogs, mm -hmm. coming in and asking Johnny for some water for him. He said, you see that creek out there? You can go get water from the creek if you need water. Sounds like him. I've had a hundred people tell me these stories, and all of the stories are about Hinky. I've had 50 people stand right here and go, you know what, I had my first beer right there when I was 15 years old. And I tell everybody, if you have a hinky story, there's a spotted cow up there waiting for you. And if you'll listen to one of mine, there's two more. <laughs> he didn't have a place to go to the bathroom, and that's if you have if you sell beer, and he did sell it, the people said he had to have a bathroom, and so he got a toilet and set it right in the middle of the room. Didn't hook it up or anything. He argued with them, I have one, that's the law. And they tried to let him get away with it, but, so, but so, for some reason they insisted that he have a toilet. And so he uh, put in a toilet. It is just a beautiful day to sit on the front porch of the Blue Room. And if I wasn't doing it right now, I'd wish I was right here doing this. That's the art farm that I'm developing, is sitting on the front porch of the Blue Room maybe sometimes having a spotted cow, and then contemplating a very long and very interesting life. I was born in Texas, grew up in a very conservative town. My fourth grade teacher was named Lachlan, and she said to the class, so I'm an Irish, what are you? And everybody said, we don't know. So they said, well, you go home tonight and find out what you are. So we all went home and came back the next day and the teacher says, all right, we'll go around the room. 
And we went around the room and every one of us said the same thing. Our parents said, you're a Texan. <laughs> so oh, one more story here. One night, Hinky was in, in here and two guys came in and they robbed him. They pushed him in this room and they slammed the door and locked it. What they didn't realize was there's a back door that goes down into the basement. So when they went outside, Hinky was outside waiting for them. But apparently all they did was shove him down and leave. I love old buildings, yeah. obviously. Yeah. And this is absolutely worthless. I mean, except for doing what we're doing right now. Yeah, yeah. And then I graduated and got on the train and went to Chicago to college. The most ethnic oriented city I mean, they are incredible. Every neighborhood is Puerto Rican, Italian, Jewish, and most of the people that I met in Chicago and got to know a lot about were black people. I'd never known anybody of any ethnic origin. So I spent four years getting that kind of an education, and people are very, very interesting. You sit here and you begin to realize how fortunate we are and how unbelievable number of people in the world right now are enduring hardships and you don't know what you can do for them. This part of the upstairs was where that Hinky had a girl who lived here. And I've had some people try to tell me that this was a cat house, but I don't, I hadn't heard that very much. And uh, then you go back in here and there's a nice little this is a nice little bedroom with really fancy wallpaper. He built this and made it nice so the girl would stay here. But the most interesting thing I found here, people always talked about he hid money. Well, this was where the bed was and right underneath the bed was this. And what this is, is just a little spot, a little safe place, and you put your money in that hole. And then you just put this back on there and put the bed over it. And it's uh, pretty hard to find. And then 1966, I got drafted. And I served in the Air Force from 66 until uh, 1971, during which time I spent a tour in Vietnam. So since I had a degree in social work, of course, they made me a maintenance officer. And I was stationed in uh, Cameron Bay. And compared to most of the places you could live in Vietnam, almost all of them, uh, Cameron Bay was a country club. So everybody's experience in Vietnam wasn't as tough as others. And the roughest thing I ever did, I insisted on getting in a C-130 that I needed to travel out to repair a plane that we had broken down in the field. And I, this guy said, well, I have one plane going there, but you can't no one's supposed to ride on it. Now, I, mean, I got to get on it. So I got on it with my crew, and it was a plane carrying people in plastic bags to Benoit, to the, and I, it changed the way you think. You know, you get on the plane and you go, uh, there's guys getting killed here. And I have no idea why they died. I have no idea to this day. This is a very large room that was never used by the Blue Room at all. It is only a mill. The, but it was a mill, and you can see in here, someone built a homemade auger out of tin cans. It used to have a box all the way around it. You can see here where that it's kind of been gone. And then the grain was brought from down below and brought up to here and it went down this box and they used that to, to bag the grain. There, there have been bats in here and hundreds of them. And of course you can tell from the iguana all over the floor, they eat a lot of mosquitoes and insects. Well, uh, they don't eat the ones that bite me. <laughs> they travel like a radar. They use, they make sounds and they hear it back and it causes me to wonder how their brain works. Is it black and white? I don't know. <laughs> but it's, in other words, it's an interesting thing to think about 
a, a living being that has a completely different method of perception than we understand. You have to be in a place where you don't think about much to come up with this kind of stuff. Uh-oh, we're going to have some more visitors here. Are you ready for a spotted cow? When school started, we would always have two or three new male faculty members that we would get, and uh, we would say, now be sure you dress up, because, well, it's parents' night, but then afterwards we're going to take you out for someplace special. It's a really a nice place. We're going to have cheese and wine, <laughs> and it's really kind of an upscale place. And then we would drive down the hill and come in here, and <laughs> they would be quite, <laughs> quite amazed, but they... That was the Blue Room experience. <laughs> that is just, uh, that is just priceless. I did not want to stay in the Air Force. So once I got my time in, I got out. My wife and I, she worked the whole time I was in and so we saved all of our money. We spent time at Yosemite, the Grand Canyon. Then we drove to New York where we had friends, came back to San Francisco where I did the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. I got a job, which I, I still, I, I guess it was the right. Went to work for an airline in Oakland and we lived there for 35 years. The only way most of us find meaning with our lives, or most people seem to, is to identify with their work. I mean, I commuted to work for a number of years and I, every day I would go, are you sure this is the right way to do this? Is this how we are supposed to live? And then my mother-in-law called and said, well, you know, your father-in-law's passed away and he left you all those crappy old buildings in Scioto Mills and the health department is hassling me about them. And my wife says, well, get in the car. And here we are. I would probably get a lot more done, but I spend most of my time sitting on the front porch of the Blue Room and people just stop here and talk and it's an eccentric group of, of all kinds of people. Oh, wait a minute, here comes. How you doing? Well, he must have ridden by here 50 times whenever we, I just barely got a hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the longest I was kind of scared of it, you know. <laughs> I'm like, what's going on with that thing, you know? Is it real haunted house? And one day he stopped came up here, sat down, and told me his life story. i like, I should have paid him for my psychology. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you could have. And he, he, he uh, recognized what I was talking about. He told me about his relatives in Texas or uh, uh, Florida. When you say you thought you was from the South until you got, what, got to Texas or something? Oh, no, no. When I got to Mississippi, I realized I was, yeah, that I just thought I was from the South. I'm not from the oh, South. Oh, I'm from Mississippi. Oh, you I got know. to Mississippi, that's the real South. No, and the Mississippi people are very, they're, they're who they are. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. How y'all doing this morning? That's one thing about this trail I like. You get some fresh air to think, and you, then you meet people on the trail like me a black guy out here I, most of the time I meet white people but I'm like listening at the the news you would think it's a war between black and white yeah. but you come out here on the trail and people stop at the rest stop if you get to talk these people like we raised in the same house we just friendly they talking the same thing they they out here for their health they out here to for the exercise, they like the deer. I'm like, yeah, we got this in car. I thought they just like me. That's right. Always good to see you. Nice talking to you. I think there's something to actually realizing that the only thing that matters is being able to share this life with other people who care about one another and who seek to make it so that those people can uh, be where we are right now. And you just uh, spend a lot of time thinking about what is genuinely significant and what's not.
The more you think about it, the more uh, reality dictates that you're not very important. You're just a factor in it that only ranks a little above those uh, bees flying around the hummingbird feeder or the leaves on the trees. I mean, you're here for a little while and you're gone. And I have learned, and I'm trying to figure this out, and I even know some people who've taught yoga, but if you give it the old yoga position, you can almost feel the world coming to you. Uh, maybe it has something to do with uh, some kind of a karma thing, but it's where you literally open yourself up to the sky. <laughs>